In today's video, we're going to take a look at the basics of bias T's. Now, these coaxial RF components are used whenever you want to add a source of DC power or even control signals to an RF line. And you might want to do this to power up a transistor, or a photodiode, a laser diode, a low noise amplifier, or something like that that might be at the far end of an RF line. Uh, even control remote RF hardware such as an antenna tuner, or coaxial switch, or even an RF amplifier. Uh, you may also want to couple low speed control and communication signals onto an RF line to maybe communicate with some remote RF hardware that's at the far end of uh, a piece of coax. Or even add a DC offset to a high speed signal, such as a high speed serial signal. We'll go into some of these applications in a bit more detail later in the video. But first, let's take a look at what a bias T is. The circuit for a bias T is really ideally quite simple. It's simply just two components, a capacitor and an inductor. And the operation is really straightforward. The capacitor will pass the RF uh, through this path here, but block DC. And then the inductor, or RF choke, will pass the DC signal out this path, but block the RF from going back up to the DC path. So on one side we've got RF, and on the other side we've got RF plus our DC signal. Now the series First. capacitor in the RF path will determine the low frequency operating limit by simply this formula, 1 over 2 pi RC, where R is the combination of the load impedance and the source impedance. The high frequency limit is, uh, you might say, well, that should just work at, to extremely high frequencies. The reality is, is that the inductor properties and the capacitor properties and their parasitics and the layout and materials used are really going to determine the high frequency performance or how high in frequency the RF path can go. Now, some of the basic specs for a bias T will include certainly the frequency range and insertion loss or and even VSWR of the RF path. And those are going to be determined largely by the capacitor uh, choice, the layout, the inductor parasitics, and such. The DC characteristics or DC specifications for you know, how much voltage you can apply and how much current you can supply through the DC path is going to be limited by things like the inductor uh, construction in terms of the size of the wire that's used, uh, saturation of any cores that it might be in the inductor, and also the voltage rating for the capacitor itself. So things can get a little tricky when we start looking at the practical details of a real bias T's construction. While the schematic of a bias T is really quite simple, the practical details of designing a wideband bias T can sometimes be pretty tricky. And it's mainly due to the parasitic properties of the various components. Let's start with the capacitor. You know, any capacitor uh, has got some parasitic inductance and at some frequency the capacitor itself will resonate with the parasitic inductance and start to look inductive instead of capacitive. We call that the self-resonant frequency of the capacitor. So the physical design of the capacitor, the choice of materials and things like that will all help to determine the self-resonant frequency of a capacitor. You know, above that self-resonant frequency the impedance is going up and we really don't consider it a capacitor anymore. Similarly, the dielectric that's used will determine the loss tension or dissipation factor for the capacitor, especially how much loss you have in it. Uh, so all of these things will make it very difficult to get a very wide frequency range with a simple series capacitor. And while the selection of a capacitor for good wideband RF performance is, can be tricky, the selection of the inductor is even worse. Uh, inductors have got parasitic capacitance, you know, the larger uh, the inductance value, the more turns we have in the inductor, so the more capacitance it has, that lowers its self-resonant frequency. So we have to have small value inductors for the high frequency components and not to have large value inductors for the low frequency components. There's also loss associated with the inductors. We have to worry about the core saturation, the core material that might be used in the wound inductor. For all these reasons, the inductor is often a series of several inductors in practical uh, applications of a bias T. But then you might set up other resonances between the parasitic elements of these series inductors and the layout and everything else. So oftentimes there are other parts that are added, resistors or even other, de other components to help DQ these other resonances that might be set up. So the practical reality is, is that very simple inductor shown in the bias T schematic is often a complex RLC circuit to give broadband blocking of the RF you know, out of the DC port and still give good RF performance through the RF path. Let's take a quick look at how these two particular bias T's are designed. 
Uh, this one is uh, rated from 100 kilohertz to 4.2 gigahertz. And if we pull the cover off of this, we can see a little bit of RF absorbing material attached to the lid. And if we look inside, here's our uh, our DC blocking cap, our series uh, cap going from the RF to the RF plus DC output. But we could also see three separate inductors as well as a DQing resistor as part of an RL network here to provide the DC path to give us good broadband uh, DC blocking over that operating frequency range. This next device is rated from 200 kilohertz to 12 gigahertz. And uh, let's take a look inside this one here. And uh, a little bit different. Uh, here's my, uh, my uh, coupling capacitor through the RF path here. But I can see one, two, three, four separate inductors that are used in here. This one also has got a, a pair of decoupling capacitors on the DC input port, so we get a little bit of R, a little bit of power supply or DC decoupling to ground right at the input, in addition to the broadband uh, inductor providing the DC path onto the bias T output. Let's take a closer look at how bias Ts are used in some common applications, and we'll even run some experiments. Uh, probably the, one of the most common uses for a bias T is to power up an LNA or a low noise amplifier that might be mounted at an antenna, you know, maybe up a mast or something pretty far away from where the receiver is. You know, the bias T would be uh, applied here so that we can apply a power supply voltage to the center of the coax to run out to the amplifier and power the amplifier up, and then the RF from the amp will just simply pass through the bias T to the receiver. Another application is uh, you know, RF applications and, or other applications like that for uh, optoelectronic components like laser diodes or photodiodes. Again, to provide the, you know, the bias to a laser, for example, to get it into its uh, active region, it might bias it up through a current source through the DC path to get the laser ready to go and then couple your high-speed RF signal onto it. Uh, photodiodes, for example, will operate at very high speeds when they're reverse biased to, you know, uh, extend the depletion region, uh, re reducing its capacitance. So a DC bias is often applied to a, uh, a pin diode, like a photodiode, to increase its speed, and then the you know, high-speed optical RF signal uh, can be coupled into uh, the detector and then coupled through the RF path into a preamp or something like that, or some kind of a receiver. Here's an example of using the bias T to add a DC offset to a high-speed serial data signal. So uh, here we see on the scope uh, the data signal centered right around uh, zero volts, right around DC. We're passing it through the bias T right here. I'm applying an adjustable power supply to this input here, and we're taking a look essentially at the output now on the scope. If I grab the knob for the power supply and start bringing the power supply up, we can see that coming up on the voltmeter, and we can see we're just adding a DC offset to that high-speed serial signal. So we can use this to maybe put that high-speed serial signal within the common mode voltage range of a high-speed serial data receiver or comparator or something like that at the far end. Now here's an interesting application where we're using two bias T's to look at the RF performance of a bipolar junction transistor. I'm using uh, one bias T to turn on and bias the transistor to a desired level and bring in an RF signal and terminating here on the test fixture and then taking the output through another bias T using the uh, a voltage source to set the collector emitter voltage to a desired level and then coupling the RF signal into, in this case I'm using an oscilloscope to make the measurement. So here's the basic setup. Actually, I have my RF signal coming in into a splitter uh, right in here. One output from the splitter is going right out to channel 1 on the scope, which is the yellow trace here on the scope. So I can see uh, the signal is being applied into the input of the bias T without actually having to probe it. Now the bias T is going into my little test fixture that I put together here, my 50, AC coupled 50 ohm termination, and a little test socket for the device under test and then the output is just coupled through a 50 ohm line into a bias T here and the other output here is coupled into channel 2 on the scope. Uh, there's a, the DC port on the output bias T is coupled in through uh, these two leads right here going through my DMM to measure collector current and then the bias T at the input is coupled in through here and actually inside this heat shrink tubing is a 27k ohm uh, resistor 
that allows me to more precisely adjust uh, the base current into the transistor to a desired collector current level. I've got a power supply over here that is being used to set up the collector emitter voltage. Another power supply up on top of the bench that is being used to drive the base current input of the bias T here. Now one of the reasons for running a test like this might be to evaluate the RF performance or gain bandwidth product of a transistor under different operating conditions. So in order to evaluate that I did a little trick in the scope here. I've got the scope actually doing a little bit of a math for me taking the RMS value of the output divided by the RMS value of the input. That's giving me a red trace. It's a little bit tough to see here, but then I've got a measurement on that. So uh, this measurement right here that shows 10.14, 10.13 right down here, that's actually the gain of the circuit. Uh, remember the DMM is showing me collector current, so right now that's running at about 10 milliamps. You would see I've got a gain of about uh, 10.1. If I increase the uh, base drive to the transistor, reaching up to the other power supply here, and let's go up to, say, 20 milliamps on this transistor or so, right about there, we can see that the gain at this same 10 megahertz that I'm applying now is uh, a gain of about 14 instead of 10. Uh, so we can actually see now what the uh, dependence is on bias conditions for the RF gain of that transistor. And the last application example we're going to take a look at is uh, adding a low speed DC control signal to an RF path. And the example here is tuning a remote antenna. And here I'm going to actually be using an antenna analyzer feeding into the bias T. And I'll apply a DC voltage that goes to a remote antenna controller that will tune the antenna up or down to adjust its resonant point. It will monitor uh, the behavior of that on the antenna analyzer. The antenna I'm using is this uh, Yesu uh, ATAS120, a remotely tuned called a screwdriver antenna, which is located on the other side of my shop right here for convenience. Now if you look very carefully at it, as I apply power to the antenna, you'll see that top section start to come down. Here we go. So that's tuning the antenna down. And if I apply a different voltage to the antenna, we can see it now tuning back up again. So that's adjusting the length of a loading coil in the antenna. Let's go monitor the effect of that on the antenna analyzer. Okay, so we've got the antenna being swept by the analyzer here. I want to move the resonant point to be within the 20 meter band. So let's uh, move the antenna a little bit. Let's see if we went in the right direction here. Nope, I need to change the power supply to go the other way. And bring it in a little bit. Let's see where we are. Bring it in a little bit more. Oh, we're getting close. A little bit more and a touch more. Boom. Now I've been able to tune that antenna remotely through the BIOS T and monitor its performance on the analyzer. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at the basics of BIOS T's and now understand a bit more about what BIOS T's are, uh, how they're designed, some of the practical limit limitations of BIOS T's, and how they're used. If you like what you see, uh, give me a thumbs up. You know, pass it along to your friends and if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do so. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.